Well, I see some boys and girls here this morning, and I uh, was just thinking uh, as I was coming down the road, and maybe there was a few here just to share a wee thought with them this morning. This is a Belfast thought, you know, you, there's nothing uh, spectacular about this little story this morning, but there's a spiritual meaning in it, and it's about a cat, a cat. And I wonder, does any of the boys and girls, do they like cats? Anybody like a cat? No, you're not cat lovers here in Cookstown then, you know. Anybody like dogs? Yeah, no. Well, I like a dog. I'm a doggy man myself. In this house I moved into where I am now in Bangor, there was a cat camped in the, in the back garden. But anyway, the dog soon got rid of him, and he's away now. But I want to tell you about a little story about a cat that lived uh, not far from where we lived in North Belfast, out there in Ballysillen. And this cat used to arrive over at our house. And this woman across the road says, whatever you do, don't feed it, because if you feed it, you'll never get rid of it. Well, I had a dog there, and it was an old dose dog, and I never bothered with a cat. But this cat, boys and girls, this morning, this cat was a friendly cat. It was a friendly cat. It would have jumped up onto the windowsill, and you could have given it a stroke, and, you know, it was friendly. Didn't bother with the dog, and the dog didn't bother it, and everybody was getting on happy, and everybody was doing fine. Until one night I happened to come home a wee bit late, I was away taking a meeting somewhere, and I heard an awful racket round the back of the house. And I says to myself, what's going on round there? And I went round, and there was these two big crows, I've never seen this. The size of the things were massive, and there was a young one down in the garden, and there was the cat. And the cat was watching the bird. And the two crows were making a racket, trying to scare the cat away. Of course, then I got rid of the cat. I chased the cat out, you see. And then I got a big broom. And I got the bird onto the broom, and I lifted it up and threw it up onto the, onto the wee outhouse out the back. And I says, well, maybe he'll take wings and fly away. I could do no more for him, you see. And I went on into the house. But when I came out the next morning, there was feathers everywhere. So there was. There was feathers everywhere. And you know, that cat must have got that bird. That bird must have tried to get off again, and it couldn't do it, and the cat got it. And there was feathers everywhere. Well, I says to myself, the poor bird, it wasn't a word of a scene. must have been carried away. But you know, the spiritual meaning in that is this, that that cat... That cat was a friendly cat. It was a friendly cat until his old instincts came into him and the old nature came into him and it knew it how to get that bird. And that's a bit like us, you know. You see, when you're young, you're not too bad. You get into a bit of mischief. But whenever sin starts to grow in your life, you see, things started to happen that you didn't maybe want to happen. You see, Somebody sings a gospel piece and it goes something like a sin will take you further than you want to go. And that old cat got the instinct and it never come back near our house again. And you see, every time I saw it after it, it went down like this. And you know, that's what we do. When sin comes into our heart and lives, we hide. Did it not happen in the Garden of Eden? When that's Adam and Eve, Sin came in, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So therefore sin entered into all men. Listen, dear friends, this morning. Keep your life clean from sin. You see, the old nature come into that cat, and the old nature can come into us, and it can take us down a road we don't want to go. That's why we come to hear the gospel, and the blood cleanses us from all sin. So you remember that the next time you see a cat, you just watch that cat. He's always after something because it's his nature and his nature has to go. And our nature has to go, that old nature. And Christ gives us a new, cre new, cre a new nature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So you remember that today, that cat. And uh, I wouldn't be cruel to a cat, you know, but my dog, that's different now. We're just going to turn uh, just to the Word of God now, to read the Word of God. 
I haven't a long reading this morning. I've only two verses, just two verses to give this morning. And it's found in Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. And we're just going to read verses 13 and 14. 13 and 14. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now for your precious word. We pray your blessing upon your word. You pray, Lord, that you'll take the word this morning and apply it to all of our hearts and to all of our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Just read it again. 13, if I shut up heaven, and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. And we know the Lord will bless his word to all of our hearts this morning. As we're driving up this morning, a beautiful drive up was this morning, and uh, the signs came up, uh, you know, as you were going along, and they were telling us to conserve water. Be careful how we use water, because it's starting to get uh, very precious, you see. The reservoirs are drying up, there's no rain, nothing coming down. And you know, and I was thinking about, I don't know what your garden like is. My garden's brown, brown at the front and brown at the back. And uh, yeah, at the end of it all, there's nothing you can do unless you get a lot of water on till it to do something with it. And whenever I moved into this house in Bangor where we are now, there was this big flower pot. Well, it wasn't a flower pot. It was a big pot in the corner. And there was a bit of a stem of a bush coming out of it, you see. So I pulled it out, you see, just to see what was going on, and I got it out more into the open, and I started to water it, put a drop of water on it, and it started to flourish, started to grow. And I keep saying to Sandra, Sandra, look at my wee bush growing away out there in the back there, with a drop of water on it there, it's growing away. So she went out one day, and she got a couple of hanging baskets, and I put them up, you see. But last week we were away, you see, or two weeks ago we were away, and a wee, went away for a wee break, took the granddaughter and the son, Neil, and, and away we went for a wee break. But whenever we came back, wasn't the two hanging baskets, well, they were absolutely miserable looking. And I couldn't revive them at all with a drop of water. And I looked at my bush, and the leaves were starting to droop. But I says, I'm going to give them a drop of water. And I put a drop of water on them, and it started to flourish again, you see. And you see, we're a bit like that too, aren't we? We get a bit dry, get a bit dry. We start to allow the, the old ways and maybe to creep in and live our lives, you know, and we all went through a pandemic there and we weren't getting to church the same and weren't doing the same things as we usually do and weren't getting to see this one and that one. And we can sort of dry up a bit, can't we? Dry up a bit. And you see... We're not satisfied. We're not satisfied. There's a story told about an evangelist, you see, and this evangelist went out, and he went out into the people all around him, and he was trying to reach them with the gospel. And he was preaching to them, and there was nothing at all happening. Not a thing was happening. And he got very frustrated, and he was praying about the whole situation and what he should do. So somebody's 
say it to him, I told him maybe to try and something new or something. So what he done was he got this big poster and, and he wrote on the poster and he told on the poster how he had a couple of acres of land and he says, and if there's anybody out there satisfied and come and tell me they're satisfied, he says, I'll give them this couple of acres of land. Well, of course, this man, he says to himself, well, I'm satisfied, he says. He says, I have a wife and a family and everything's doing well, a good job and children are doing well in school and have a nice house, car, everything's going well. He says, I'm going to go and claim that bit of land. So he went up and he says to the evangelist, and he told them all that. And the evangelist says, well, if you're satisfied, where do you want my bit of land? You see, we can get satisfied. We can get dry. Well, this little verse of scripture I want to look at this morning there in verse uh, 14. It says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So therefore, we're going to look at it. And we're going to just take a little bit at a time and we're going to work our way through it. Now I've listened to people preach on it and they preach very good messages on it. But there's an awful lot in it. And there's probably more in it than I could share with you this morning about that little verse of scripture. You see it tells us there in verse 13 it says, If I shut up heaven, you know, if God was to shut up heaven with, there would be no rain. What a state we would be in. Or he says, or I command the locusts to devour the land. Or he says, or if I send a pestilence amongst my people. And you see, God's telling Solomon here, and when you read on in the verses before it, he says, if you ever get to that place where these things start to happen, he says, then I have the answer. There's the answer there. There's the answer there in verse 14. And the first little point I want to make is, it says there, if my people, if my people, you see, they're redeemed of the Lord. That's why I was singing those wonderful hymns this morning, as I was singing that, that second one there. And, and, and there's some tremendous, tremendous verses in it that tells us there in 366. And it says there, I am redeemed. Oh, praise the Lord. You see, can you say that this morning, dear friends? Can I say that? I am redeemed. Oh, praise the Lord. And then it says, my soul from bondage free. I've been set free. I've been set free from the bondage of sin and the bondage of Satan. Now, I'm not saying he still doesn't come and he attacks but I don't belong to him anymore. For a lot of my life, I belong to him. I don't belong to him now. And then it goes on to say, has found at last, at last a resting place in him who died for me. Isn't that tremendous, dear friends, this morning? And there we see there, the redeemed of the Lord. He's talking about if my people, if my people. See, First Peter 18 and verse 19, it tells us there, that great man Peter and the tremendous work that he was doing. And he says there in verse 17, and, and, and verses 18 and 19, For as much as ye know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Them things, are, them things can't save us, you see, silver and gold. And it says, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. You know, you might come from a background, dear friends, this morning that has known uh, the word of God through all their grandparents and great-grandparents and whatever. And I always say you could uh, stand at the gate of heaven with a Bible in your hand and not get in. And he says there, receive by tradition from your fathers. Just because our family are saved, it doesn't mean that we're saved. We might have been brought up in the home and brought up with the word of God. But you see, we need to know we're redeemed. You see, and, and he says here, then, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. A lot of places a day you don't mention the blood. And you hear, you see, he's saying, if my people, the redeemed of the Lord, you see, the redeemed of the Lord. That's us, dear friends. If you're redeemed today, if the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all your sin, and you're walking in the light of his word, then, dear friends, you're redeemed. How we love to proclaim it. So therefore, you see, that little first little phrase, if my people. That comes on to the people of God. And then it goes on to say, the responsibility to the Lord, responsibility now to the Lord, which are called by my name, you see. We have a name. We have a name, you see. And we wouldn't like anything hard or bad to be said about our name, our name. Our name, the name that we have, you see. I have a name. And I wouldn't like anybody to uh, say anything about the name that I have. And you see the responsibility to the Lord. You see, here, dear friends, we have a responsibility. A responsibility to the Lord, which are called by my name. He says, you're called by my name. You're a Christian, you see. And we know that the first time that Christian was mentioned in the Word of God, it was mentioned in Acts 11 and 26 at Antioch. At Antioch, that's when it was first mentioned. Christian, Christ-like, you see. We have to be Christ-like. And you see, it was, it was mentioned too by Agrippa in Acts 26, verse 28, when Agrippa says, Almost! Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You see, you can be almost persuaded but lost. And you see, Grippa heard the gospel. And he knew there was a difference in this man, Paul. And he knew, you see. And then it's mentioned again there by Peter in, in 1 Peter 4 and 16. He says, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. We suffer for being Christians. We don't allow self-afflicted things to come into our lives by doing things that, that people will, 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 will say things about us. We're, we're Christians. We have to live a Christ-like life. Oh, you have an enemy, dear friends, who goes about like a roaring lion or an angel of light and he'll try and do everything in his power. To take away that testimony. To take away that thing that you have that is precious to God, which is your testimony. You do everything. The people watch. The people look upon us, dear friends, today. How are we handling things? The things that we go through day and daily. Our speech. You see, the responsibility to the Lord. I have a responsibility today. I have a responsibility for my family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren. But first of all, I have a responsibility to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a responsibility that is given to the redeemed. If my people, which are called by my name, his name, that name that is above every name, and the day will come that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I probably told my testimony in here many a time, but I could see if through one little verse of Scripture. Romans 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And you know what, dear friends, the responsibility is ours if you're the redeemed of the Lord. I have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. The redeemed of the Lord, my people, Jesus says, have a responsibility. And then it goes on to say, shall humble themselves. The reverence 
towards the Lord. We need to have reverence, you see. Reverence for the Lord. There needs to be reverence. You know, when John was on the Isle of Patmos, and there was John being persecuted for being a Christian. Get that man and stick him away on that island or away out of the road. And there he was on the island, and maybe he was doing hard labor, and he was wailing in his 90s, and working away on that island, and maybe just saying to himself, he says, has the Lord forgotten me? Has the Lord forgot about me? But I doubt very much if he had. He was there, and the Lord had looked after him all those years from he met with him. And there he was, just working away on this island of Patmos. Maybe he was saying, I wonder if the Lord's anything else for me. And the Lord appeared. And it says, whenever the Lord appeared, he hit the deck. Reverence. You know, we need to have reverence. Reverence towards God. The things of God, the house of God, the people of God. Even when we're going about reverence. Mr. Cross, always remember Mr. Cross. Never forget him, you know. And he says as he was going along the road and he would have seen a bit of money laying there, he would have said, it doesn't belong to me, leave it there. I never forgot that. And I was coming along the Ballyselling Road one day and, and I was walking along, I saw a five pound note. And I looked at it and I saw a woman away down the road. And so I lifted the five pound note and I ran after her and it was running away down the road. I got there and excuse me, I says, you come down that road and there was a five pound note laying there. She says, it wasn't mine. So I had to go all the way back and put the five pound back down again. You might say I was a simple little thing. Why don't you just put it in a box or something like that? But it didn't belong to me. We shouldn't take things that don't belong. I was brought up in a house and one of the things that was hammered into me was don't touch anything that doesn't belong to you. God's watching you see. You see, reverence, reverence towards God. John had reverence towards God. When the Lord met with him, he fell to his face. And he had tremendous reverence for God and the things of God. Shall humble themselves. Dear friends, it's better we humble ourselves than God humbles us. You see, whenever God humbles us, you see, it can be sore. It can be sore. And I have been humbled. I have been humbled. God's humbled me. It's been sore. And you may need to be humble before God and the things of God and the people of God and the ways of God forever to have an impact in this decaying land that we're living in. And then it says the request from the Lord and pray. You see, so we're, we're going into it. We're going into a bit of a par- pattern. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Now, this is where prayer comes in, you see. And there has to be prayer. There has to be prayer. And you know, what's the secret of prayer? Well, there's many things we can talk about by prayer and the prayer meetings. And we always know there was some tremendous revivals and they all came through prayer. Meeting in a schoolhouse or whatever whatever it was. I always remember a little missionary story I heard one time about a missionary and he was out in a mission field for years and, and everything was just dry and he wasn't getting anywhere. And then he started to do something. He says, I started to bind the enemy. I started to pray that God would bind the enemy. Bind the enemy. And he was praying, bind the enemy. Spoil his goods. Rebuke the devil. And things started to happen. And there's a lot of things going on out there, dear friends, around us. And there's an awful lot of things going on. And it's all Satan's behind the whole lot. But there's a little verse of scripture here in John 15 and verse 7. And it says this. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, 
and it shall be done unto you. I read that many times, many, many times. But over the past lockdown, I, I started to read it again and it started to come to me. And I, I read about Warren Wearsby and what he said about it and maybe other people. But it, it's simple. There's four little A's in that. First one is, if ye abide in me, abiding. That means holding on to Jesus Christ. Holding on to him. When you get up in the morning and hold on to him. When you're going through the day, you need to hold on to him. When you come to the end of the day, you need to hold on to him. Abide in him. Be part of him. Whenever he says, if ye walk in the light, we need to walk in the light with him. Walk with him. He's there with us. Every moment of the day, we need to remember that. Abide in him. And then he goes on to say, and my words abide in you. There's an agreement, you see. We have to be obedient to the word of God. Ah, oh, his words abiding in us. The word of God abiding in me, abiding in you, reading it, obeying it, listening to it. You might not always, you might not always like what you, what you read, uh, and the Lord might be telling you something and you don't understand what it is he's saying to it, but at the end of the day, we need to have that word in our hearts and life and be obedient to it. And my words abide in you. That's the life, the same as the plant needed the water to live. We need the word of God to live spiritually in this wicked, evil world. We need the word. Many's a time, Sandra and myself, looking at things before us, and then you get the word. Many's a time I say, I don't feel like going there. I don't feel like going anywhere near that place. I'm not talking about here this morning, folks. I'm, all there are things in my life. I don't feel like going anywhere near that place. And then you get the word. You get a word from the Lord and you go and you do. And the Lord takes you through. And then he says, if, my, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, agreement, ye shall ask what ye will. Do we ask amiss? James says you can ask amiss. Do we ask when we're asking or is there no hindrances between us and the Lord? Does he answer the, the simple little things? Does he answer the, the big things? Does he make a way where there is no way? Maybe you're sitting here that day and you're looking at a situation and you're saying to yourself, how am I going to get through? How am I going to get through that? How am I going to get through? Jesus says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. There's the answer. There's the answer, dear friends. God will answer your prayer. What's the sense of praying if they're not going to be answered? We have to pray and believe. Believe. Is there anything in my life, Lord? Is there, is there a hindrance? Is there a hindrance? See that plant. I says to Sander about that plant, you know, I says, I'm going to have to keep on watering that plant. But if I was to dig a hole in the garden and put it into the garden and, and leave it there, it would, there would be more sustenance coming, there would be more uh, coming into it, more water, more life coming into it. It was stuck away in a corner, you see. It wasn't getting light, it wasn't getting water. You see, we need to know the answers to prayer. So he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and pray, and seek my face, the radiance of the Lord. Oh dear, you see, the Apostle Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus, he saw the face of Jesus. He saw the Lord shining all around him. That's the face of Jesus. It was shining all around him. He was never the same again. There he is going down this road, making all his plans when I get down there. See, when I get down that road, I ain't going to sort these Christians out once and for all, these followers of, a, of this 
this man Jesus. He's dead, and I'm going to sort them out. And then he saw the face of Jesus. Have you saw the face of Jesus, dear friends? Have you saw that wonderful presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? He's there, you see, he's alive. He's alive forevermore. Praise the Lord. And you see here, the radiance of the Lord and seek my face. The Apostle Paul, he saw the face of Jesus. And when you see the face of Jesus, you're never the same again. What did he do? He went straight into the synagogue and he preached Christ. He says, Jesus is alive. Can you say that today? Jesus is alive. I have new life in me. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. And he was stopped in his tracks and he was never the same again. And if you've met with Jesus Christ, dear friends, you're never the same again. Never. You might make mistakes, but you're never the same again. Do you know what reminds me of, of whenever Sandra and myself got saved? We got saved the same night. Sandra's sister got saved. Her brother-in-law got saved. Her brother was saved. My son Neil was saved. My daughter made a profession. God moved. God moved in a wonderful way, a little mini revival. In one of the hardest places in Belfast, in the upper Ardoin. God can move in the darkest places, dear friends. Doesn't matter how dark it is. If God gets in there, I'm telling you, he can change things. And we need the Lord to get into some places in this land of ours, to make change. And I think it needs to start, start up there in that place, up on and on the upper Newton Ards Road. Change! There needs to be change. Places drying up in our, before our very eyes. Our children are in danger. Corrupt minds trying to corrupt them. There needs to be a change. The radiance of the Lord and see my face. That people can see the change in our lives. They saw it in Paul. Is that not that boy? That's that boy that, that, that was persecuting all them Christians. And now he's preaching Christ. He's alive. Change. And then they're returning to the Lord and turn from their wicked ways. Their wicked ways. Their wicked ways, you see. Acts 2. Little verse there in Acts 2. It says there in verse 36. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. You can't say that word today. Conversion. You can't say it. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And turn away from those ways, dear friends. Maybe you're involved in something, dear friends. It's taken away your testimony and drying you up. Get rid of it. Get out of it. Come away from it. I had to go and see a lot of people and get a lot of things put right. The Lord speaks. You need to go. I went in fear and trembling. The Lord helped undertook. And you see, dear friends, and turn from their wicked ways. Get rid of the things that are hindering and drying us up. And then we see the reaction of the Lord. Then will I hear from heaven. We'll hear from heaven. 
God is up there, dear friends, and he's just waiting to speak. He's just waiting to speak. He's just waiting to move. Just like he moved with Moses. Remember Moses? <laughs> uh, down to the burning bush. Down to the bush. Looked at the bush. Moses. Moses. God spoke. Samuel. Samuel. God speaks, dear friends. He hears. He sees. He speaks. He knows all things. He sees all things. He hears all things. He knows the way ahead. He knows where you're coming from. He knows where you are now. You can't hide anything from him. He's everywhere. God knows. And you see here it says, Then will I hear from heaven. We'll hear from heaven. We'll hear. God will speak. God will speak. And I tell you what, dear friends, when God speaks, the fear will come in to this land. Fear. People don't fear God. Fear God. Never mind what else. Fear God. And you see here the reaction of the Lord. Then will I hear from heaven. And they're restoring to the Lord and will forgive their sins. You see, that's the hindrance. Sin. The little foxes that spoil the vines. The little things, dear friends, God wants to get rid of. Sometimes he finds it, we find it harder to get rid of the wee things than the, the big things. Oh, don't do that anymore. No, don't do this anymore. It's the little things. The little things that creep into our lives. We allow them to come in. And you see here, they're restoring to the Lord and will forgive their sin. Do you remember the prodigal? No. Prodigal come home. I don't know, maybe there's a prodigal here today. Maybe there's a prodigal sitting in this church today. You're just coming here and, and you're just going through the motions and uh, you're, you're, you're just not as, as sharp for the Lord as you used to be. You know, you maybe haven't went in the way of, of the prodigal we read about here in Luke 15. Maybe you haven't gone down that road in amongst all the swine and the pigs and all that he was going through. Before he came to himself. Maybe you wouldn't have been there. Maybe your heart's just not there with God today. It's just not there. And here he says, and when he came to himself, thank God when we can come to ourselves and get a bit of sense into our lives. And he says, and many hard servants of my fathers have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger. You see, if you're not reading the Word of God and you're not studying the Word of God and you're not going to the prayer meetings and you're not coming to the services, you'll dry up, you'll hunger. He says you'll, you'll perish with hunger. He says, I will arise. I will arise and go to my Father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. You see, it's against heaven. God and God, did not David say that? See, that's thee and thee only have I done these things. And then he goes on to say, and he rose and came to his father, and when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against heaven. And in thy sight, Am I no more worthy to be called thy son? The shame of it all, dear friends. The shame, even when the devil gets the batter off us. The shame of it all. But he knew what he needed to do, and maybe you need to get back to the Father today. Maybe you need to get back to God today. You see, sin will take you further than you want to go, and you'll maybe start going a wee bit more, and a wee bit more, and a wee bit more. And maybe you're only going once or twice to this place. Maybe you're starting to go a wee bit more. And it's dragging you down and it's keeping you away from the prayer meeting. The boiler house of the church, as young Samuel said. Dear friends the day, we need to get back to the prayer meeting. And then it says the revival from the Lord. It says there, 
Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He's going to heal us. If we obey the instructions, he's going to heal us. If you get a prescription for medication, they say to you, take it all. Take it all, every bit of it. Why? Because it will heal you. And the blood, dear friends, it'll heal the church. The blood of Jesus. It'll cleanse the church. It'll cleanse us. Maybe we need to be uh, individually revived today. But whatever the case may be, dear friends, the revival's from the Lord. It's from the Lord. It's not a working up of man. It's not a working up of, of people getting together and let's have a revival meeting. Who knows how God will move? Who knows who he has standing in the shadows just waiting to come out to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ? There's men like John Weir that are going about preaching, preaching his heart out. And dear friends, the day, the revival from the Lord. It's from the Lord. We obey the instructions. God sends the revival. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There's the answer. There's the answer. And the responsibility is ours. If my people. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, your word is truth. And we pray, Lord, you'll give us a heart to obey your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Five oh four. This is another wonderful hymn. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Let us stand as we sing.
Father, now take us to our homes in safety, Lord. Bless us and help us throughout this day. Bless the service tonight. Pray for Brother Billy Parker, Lord, as he comes with the word of God. Bless the word. Draw in dear souls, Lord. Oh, Father, draw them in. Bring them in, Lord. And boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Perishing souls out there, Lord, day and daily. But pray, Father, you'll come. And bless this church. In Jesus' name we ask it.